How's it going everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. Today we'll be looking at the epic finale of the Hell House LLC trilogy in part 3, Lake of Fire, where the evil Abaddon Hotel reopens its doors to the public. Russell Wynn has taken his interactive live show Insomnia into the long abandoned and haunted hotel, with often expected and terrifying results. Although it becomes clear there is much more in play than we realize. The big question when I watch Lake of Fire, does it work as a satisfying conclusion to the Hell House series? And to me, it definitely did, which is a success on its own. It also addressed some of my issues with part two, and here returns to the more documentary format and mysterious tone of the first film. We again follow a group as they lead up to an opening night event, which we saw before didn't go so well with the original Hell House crew. And they do twist the same kind of story format into interesting new directions. A lot of it is thanks to the hard to pin down lead character Russell who is behind the show. You never really know his motivations or which side he's on, with the movie constantly shedding doubt on him and his intentions, which all works to keep things intriguing throughout the runtime. It also brings back some of those classic found footage style scares the series is synonymous with, and I feel like this time they balance things a bit better, with more subtle what was that moments in addition to big jump scares. And it also brings back several of the hotel's previous victims, giving this a nice through line to the previous two films. I honestly thought after part two there wasn't much else to say about the Abaddon and the evil cult spirit. Andrew Tolley. So it was a pleasant surprise that Lake of Fire continues to build on the series mythology in new and quite important ways, leading to a final battle between good and evil, or really heaven and hell itself. So let's head back to the Abaddon Hotel for a final time for the Lake of Fire, learning all about the final group that will enter its halls, the importance and truth behind Russell's character, as well as explaining the ending and what it means. We pick up nine years after the original Hell House opening, and one year after the disappearance of Jessica and her crew as seen in the previous Hell House 2. The whereabouts of all of them still unknown. Although there's more than enough bad stigma associated with the evil Abaddon Hotel at this point that the town decides to finally demolish it. Good choice. How many more dummies are you going to let wander in there to never be heard from again? But at the last moment, the enigmatic leader of a media empire, Russell Wynn, steps in and purchased the hotel, saving it from destruction. And as we remember, he was the one that edited the Hell House 2 footage, so he's been receiving footage from spirit leader Andrew Tully and the hotel for some time. Remember, Tully's whole thing is intending to lure more souls into the hotel walls, where he can claim more victims to join his hell-fueled lake of fire. And it appears that Russell is falling right into Tully's hands, just as Alex and the ill-fated Hell House crew did nine years prior. Russell is intending to use the obviously very haunted hotel for the site of his latest avant-garde theatrical performance piece called Insomnia, a modern take on Faust, which is all about a bet made between between Satan and God over a man's soul. One actress in the cast, Jane, heralding it as being a great interpretation of the story for millennials, which yeah, sounds like some pretentious nonsense, and who the hell would want to pay money for that anyway? This is one aspect I like about the literal cast here, those who make up the cast of Russell's play. They are all a bunch of empty-headed douchebag actors, clearly only here because lack of other prospects, and seeing them taking their craft far too seriously is pretty amusing, along with me having no issues watching these idiots get dragged to hell or what have you. I call them idiots as several of the cast haven't even watched the previous Hell House documentaries that clearly lay out the place as chock full of evil that wants to take people's souls. It's all right there in the footage, and all those people are dead, you fool! For some justification, it does seem that Russell is paying them so much for their parts that they couldn't possibly say no. So that helps explain why they're doing this ridiculous show in the first place in the middle of nowhere in New York, when a newly minted host of Morning Mysteries, Vanessa, seemingly quite a skeptic, can't help but laugh when when doing an intro covering the hotel's sordid history, yet finds herself a little skittish when on the verge of entering, considering what allegedly has happened there in the past. I mean, again, like at least 30 people have gone missing at this point. The usually supernaturally active hotel seems strangely quiet, with so much bustling and people all over the place, hard at work before the show's big opening. And we follow these days as they lead up to the big opening night, seeming like we're set up for the exact same disastrous path of the Hell House crew all over again. But she gets over her fear and is given a tour by Jeff through the Faust-inspired decor, featuring a journey from heaven to hell and everything in between. Pointing out the white-sheeted room that stands in for heaven is where God will make a wager with the devil. Vanessa believes she spots 
someone else at some point, but Jeff says it happens to everyone here, calling it Abaddon eyes. Well, isn't that cute? Even though we know they are really seeing some of the lost souls trapped at the Abaddon, waiting impatiently until opening night to be unleashed. And it turns out that strange disappearances aren't only linked to the hotel, but years before Alex and the others came, a nearby carnival had similar disappearances, showing that the evil isn't completely contained inside the hotel. And it's not long until they see one of the spirits for themselves, camera guy Louie catching a ghostly woman in the background during an earlier interview. This time, instead of just one or two cameras in the mix, everyone in the cast is given their own, and told by Russell to record literally everything they possibly can. Again, just as Alex desired before. And there are several similarities between the two, as it's hard to pin down his motives here. Though we get our first clue to something being up, when during a meeting in the attic where Alex hung himself, nice spot for a mobile HQ, there's still blood on the walls for God's sakes. Jeff reveals that a call came in from all of Russell's banks, wondering if he should be concerned. But Russell assures him it's nothing to worry about, but is given more cause for concern when Russ receives a mysterious package from a local priest, Father Paulus, and doesn't tell him what's inside. Secret secrets, Russell. And the question soon becomes just how much does he know about how things work at the Abaddon? Is he intentionally following Alex's pattern for some evil purposes? Vanessa interviews the priest working in some capacity with Russell, asking if he knows about Tully and his desired gateway to hell. He does admit there are many references to heaven and hell in the church, including just what Tully believed, that a demon called Abaddon guarded a gateway to hell. Unfortunately, based on this perceived history, it is impossible for any human to close the gate. And could only be done by an angel from God, warning that if indeed there is a portal, it could lead to literal hell on earth. Well, that's not good usually. Vanessa is impressed by Russell's leadership, how he's able to keep the spirits of the crew high and also keeping rules in place for their safety, wanting everyone out of the hotel every night by 9 p.m. But later that night, when the crew is relaxing around a bonfire, Jane is dared to go into the hotel and touch one of those infamous trio of clown mannequin props down in the basement. Everyone agrees not to tell Russell, and since Jane still doesn't believe there's anything wrong with the hotel, her being one of those that never watched the previous documentaries, she's unafraid to go in alone. And the hotel is at least much creepier at night and without all the many crew members around. And she's soon greeted by the so-called Hell House theme playing on a piano nearby. And she assumes it's just a prank by the other actors. Though we see for ourselves that is definitely not the case. At one point, turning the camera on herself in the bar, and the entire Hell House crew and others are glimpsed standing right behind her. But of course she doesn't notice. People sure are unobservant in these movies, or maybe you can't actually see the spirits until after. Maybe, I don't know. Undeterred, she enters the always spooky basement and does one better, planting a smooch on the middle clown. And when pulling back, the main one's head has turned, instantly sending Jane into a panic. She drops the camera, seeing the clown has gotten to his feet. Phew, well that was a close one, lady. And when learning of what happened, Russell is upset that she didn't follow his curfew. And even though when checking the tape, they do see the clown for themselves, they elect to spin the narrative as being another prank. Man, these guys sure do love pranks that will scar people for the rest of their lives. Sounds like fun. Jane didn't show up to set that morning and worried she might quit, Russell has an easy solution, doubling her pay, which is enough to get her to stay. Another actor, Mike, echoes similar sentiments, that the pay was just too good to pass up, even with a little supernatural mischief to put up with, which is tested when another crew sees one of the hotel's guests walking through the hell hall. Sarah, our last survivor of the Hell House team entering room 2C, the same where Sarah took Diane. She sits on the bed covered in a sheet. Getting closer to her, the door slams closed and she vanishes. She turns back, seeing a red-eyed Sarah. Izzy dropping her camera and running off. Seems to be a pattern here, but at least they don't just keep holding on to the camera for no reason. Getting footage would not really be high on my list when seeing that shit. Even though they do offer Izzy the same deal as Jane, she still decides to leave, forcing Russ and the others to find a cover up to explain her leaving. Harvey he tries to bring light to what they're obviously avoiding, that something is seriously amiss at the Abaddon, remembering how the Hell House crew did not follow the obvious warning signs. But Russell assures him things are going to work out and no one is going to get hurt. Finding that harder and harder to believe, dude. In addition to Sarah, it turns out that others of the Hell House crew showed up unbeknownst to Izzy, several others popping up in the backgrounds of her social media posts. Later, Louie is having some camera issues, leaving Vanessa on her own to get his bag. Lights nearby clicking 
looking on catch her attention. She takes the camera to investigate, entering the brightly lit heaven hall. At the end, she hears footsteps. And when turning the camera on herself, we see one of the angels has come to life with dark eyes, which guess what? She doesn't notice. But she does notice Jessica, the previous investigative reporter who went missing a year prior. The gang talk about what she saw, still trying to downplay it. And Vanessa gives in, wanting to forget all about it, as she's worried about appearing weak to her male co-workers. Oh man, the hard-hitting work of morning journalism. I'm sure morning mysteries is a fucking nightmare to work at. Though Louie assures her she's not crazy, as he saw everything she did on the footage. The next step, she decides being to confront Russell and demand answers about what he knows. Busting into his hotel room, they find he's watching footage featuring Mitchell from Hill House 2, and when trying to get anything out of him, he completely dodges their inquiries and pushes them out of his room. Despite everything going on, it seems that Jeff and Russell have everything on track for the opening and continue their preparations. But they're gonna need to keep their covering up skills sharp as the spirits become even more pervasive. Harvey leading a light test. As he flips them on, a woman appears at the desk in the room behind him, then begins to saunter right towards him as another light clicks on. Then in the total darkness, something touches Harvey, startling him, and beckons them to turn all the lights on. But when he does, there's no sight of the woman in the room. Even stranger, Jeff overhears Greg having a conversation with a girl in the dining room, and her voice turns sinister and demonic, saying he's coming, and they're all going to hell. Yet when they enter the room, no one is sitting across from him, even though Greg is sure that she was just there. And when giving her description, Jeff is disturbed, as it matches that of Sarah, who we already saw earlier. Returning to our bearded interviewee Robert, he says Ross had his enablers that helped him keep things on track, like Jeff, who never really questioned him, which he is finally starting to do now. Similar to Alex before, the Hell House crew being loyal to him as friends for years. Yet unlike Alex, who didn't know what he got his friends into, Robert says that Russell knew exactly what he was doing the whole time. Now 100% certain that he is doing this performance here on purpose to bring Tully back for his crew's souls. But why? Though Russell excels at making everyone feel comfortable, and the night before opening, everyone is still on board and excited, meeting up that night at the local bar for a drink. The same bar Jessica and her crew went to before entering the hotel last year. Seems like probably would be a good idea to avoid that bar if it was me. Last place they were seen alive and everything. Ah well. Russ joins the others for a brief appearance, making unreasonable demands from the small town's barkeep, and coming across as pretty stuck up. Even when everyone expresses surprise at him showing up, he says he wants to be with his people. Jeez, what a, what a pompous dick bag. Vanessa asks him how he feels that all the tickets for the show are sold out, but he changes the subject to opening night, and encourages her to not go, and doesn't explain why this is. Though when leaving, she stops him, and whispers something into her ear that shocks her. She doesn't recount what he told her, but must be somehow related to Father Paulus. As Vanessa heads there in an attempt to learn more about the nature of his and Russ's relationship, she expresses concern about opening night and the hundreds of people who will be going through the hotel, believing Russell wants them to join the Lake of Fire. And Paulus spills that at midnight tonight, Russell is liquidating all of his assets, asking him to distribute them to various charities, really making it seem like he knows what's going to happen, and he does not plan on surviving the night. With this bombshell, Vanessa posts an article explaining Closing Russell's financial plans, even though it was off the record, breaking several journalistic rules, and it quickly gains national coverage within an hour, all within the hopes of preventing the opening from happening. When the others learn of this on the news, they wonder what that means for insomnia. But of course, Russell still plans to go ahead with the opening unabated. And we come to find out that his plan has been in motion for some time, even prior to the Hell House crew's arrival. Seeing more footage from that meeting at the diner back in April 2009, we see that Russell was nearby. And even last year, seeing Jessica and Molly there, Russell is walking in just as they're walking out, indicating he's been watching things behind the scenes way longer than we could have possibly expected. And now his long in the works plan has come to pass, going outside to hype up the waiting crowd, ushering them inside where they're handed blank white masks for them to wear. It's your standard crappy event guard art installation thingy at first, with Mark as Mephistopheles and Greg as Faust arguing over the value of his soul, turning asunder when a scream rings out nearby, and with good 
cause. The clown guy propped up on the wall to everyone's confusion, as well as Harvey seeing Tully himself beginning to manifest back in 2C, blinking back and forth between our world and the next. Russell grabs a camera of his own, entering the room, and is greeted by Tully, congratulating him on playing his part, encouraging him to sit back and enjoy his destiny about to be fulfilled, as they will all be joining the Lake of Fire together. The beast time has come at last, he says. Sure sounds like he was really going for that hell on earth thing they were talking about, and Tully interrupts the insomnia scene, clarifying that he doesn't wager for souls, describing it as much more complicated than that. I'll say his whole thing is way too complicated. Greg demands to know who he goddamn is, Tully's voice turning demonic, saying there's no god here, and killing Greg by crushing his face with his old man's strength. As the portal's floodgates are open, unleashing tons of rogue minions all attacking the visitors, sending the place into total bedlam, screaming and running and death at every hallway turn. The horde taking as many as they can get a hold of, and slaying them all, and this time even making it out of the building into the parking lot. Ah shit! Well, so much for outside the hotel being safe. Back inside, Vanessa in the bar is in a state of total shell shock, seeing all the murder unfolding in front of her eyes, and she finally gets to her feet, momentarily seeing Tully there waiting for her before vanishing when the camera rotates back. But he and her followers don't stay away for long. Vanessa grabs a camera and gets snatched up and taken to the basement. There she is quite plainly killed, stabbed in the stomach, Tully watching over as she collapses. But a wrinkle Tully would never expect throws a wrench into his hell on earth plans. Someone else entering surprisingly evil spirit, a heavenly aura all around him. He locks arm in arm with Tully, a ring of fire appearing around them, and still locked in battle, the hotel begins to crumble and collapse in on itself. In the aftermath, the reporter explains that somehow the entire staff and patrons were all found alive in the cornfield behind the hotel. Again, strangely, everyone is okay, only knowing for sure that a fire started in the hotel basement, and now the Abaddon has been completely destroyed, ending Tully's reign of terror once and for all. The savior, it turns out, is Russell. A few years back, he had an accident, which caused him to technically die for a few minutes, only to surprise surprisingly pull through and come back, though some mentioned the accident had changed him. This was in a much more powerful way than we could have realized until the end. As Father Paulus said earlier, no man could ever close the portal, only an angel. So it appears that while technically dead, Russell was tasked with an important mission to save our world, to destroy the Abaddon and close the portal to hell, being chosen to take on this momentous task, and in some sense was granted angelic powers, enough light to counterbalance and fight back against Tully. This is why he was so obsessed with the Abaddon and collected all the footage he could from the previous groups that went inside. He was trying to learn as much as he could about how to set things up, as well as why he so explicitly followed the same pattern laid out by Alex. He was intending, and indeed hoping, that by doing the same thing that Tully would appear and give him a chance to destroy him. And he was right when he earlier promised that no one would get hurt, as the entirety of people inside, including those actually killed like Vanessa, in his sacrifice and destroying the hotel he was able to bring them back. As they were helpless and forced to only play their part in the grander scheme to take down Tully, they did not have their souls taken to the Lake of Fire or were trapped in the hotel walls as there were no more walls. So this latest group was able to be brought back to normal. However, we see that those that were already taken weren't as lucky. Thanks to more tapes uncovered in Russell's hotel room. Picking up back with the original Hell House crew with Paul where he slid his own throat, right near the end of the first film. Now there's no blood on the wall and Paul seems miraculous miraculously alive. Soon, the others who were all killed prior join him one by one and all appear fine. Yet they are still inside the hotel, unlike the 2018 inhabitants where the hotel is destroyed. And when laughing the whole thing off, wanting to head back to New York, Alex finds the door outside jammed closed. Unfortunately, as they were taken earlier, they are still unable to leave, and their souls are still inside, so to speak. Russell then appears and explains that they died here and were taken by the hotel. Alex can't accept this, breaking down and futilely pulling on the door to no avail. Russell apologizes for the unfortunate turn of events, but solemnly declares that it's time for them to move on. They make their way through the hallway, symbolically passing into the afterlife, so at least they get to have some kind of peace after all. Alex is the last, struggling with his fate, but Sarah calms him down, taking his hand as they walk together into the proverbial light. At least they'll be partying together in the afterlife for all of eternity. Although I do wonder if the others, like even Diane and Jessica, also get to go to heaven, or what's the deal with that? 
actually thought since they bothered to bring Jessica back that she would have had the same kind of moment that LLC crew did and got to cross over. Or indeed all of the previous victims we've seen in the trilogy. That would have been a cool big final moment for the series. But guess not. It was more about the gang and that was a through line through the trilogy and that's more of what they focused on. So it makes sense that we only see their endings too. But as far as I'm concerned everyone that was trapped in the hotel at least gets to move on to the afterlife. Which just about wraps up this ending explained for Hell House 3 Lake of Fire. The conclusion definitely ties together the trilogy into a nice neat bow that does feel satisfying to the overall story. Which I was pleasantly surprised by. Tully's grand plan of opening the portal was stopped in his tracks by Russell, boiling down to a grand battle of good versus evil over people's souls, just like in Russell's play. How's that for thematic resonance? The portal is closed, the hotel is destroyed, and the evil at the Abaddon has been put to rest permanently. So with that, we bid adieu to the Hell House crew, the Abaddon Hotel, and the Hell House series once and for all. See y'all in the Lake of Fire. Gonna go make me a Hell Portal sounds pretty daggum sweet. What did you guys think of Hell House 3 Lake of Fire? Did you feel it was a satisfying conclusion to the trilogy, or were you left wanting more? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.